2 Corinthians chapter number 5. Catch y'all up to speed. Last week we did our primer, if you will, introduction to the study of the end times. <clears throat> to get you back up to speed, our pastor about three weeks ago already preached on the rapture, did the, as good a job as you can do. We're going to summarize that again. But the only thing missing between now and the beginning of the book of Revelation is that the rapture has to take place. That is the last prophetic event remaining to happen. We showed you last time that depending on whenever God considers Israel to be reformed as a nation, that 70 years after that's what he's promised and that that generation will not pass away. Well, 70 years according to man's calendar, would have put it at 2018. Then, God said in the Bible that if you live above 70 years, that you're blessed. The only thing that we are living on is the very grace of God. There is no promise tomorrow. We know that no tomorrow is promised. The only thing that we have is today. But, literally, the only thing keeping the Son from coming back and getting the bride of Christ, the church, is that the Father hadn't said, go get your bride yet. When's that going to happen, Brother Jordan? I don't know. Could be today, could be tomorrow, could be 200 years from now. I do not know. But what I do know is that the only thing keeping it from coming is the mercy and the grace and the long-suffering of God. To make a space of grace for more to become children of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. But when we get into end time prophecy some of it is linear some of it is not linear some of it we have made theological terms like rapture you will not find that in the bible the bible calls it the catching away of the saints okay the rapture is when those that are still alive in the flesh are called up to meet jesus in the air those that have died already being saved they'll rise first because they need a little bit of extra time to change. But their soul, because you know, to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord, we know that their soul will be reunited with their body, that Christ is transformed into a body like his own. We, which are alive and remain, also going to be called up, meet them in the clouds, and then the Bible says, so shall we ever be with Christ. That event of the rapture, starts the book of Revelation and the events of the book of Revelation. But we can't get to Revelation first because of the nonlinear prophecy in the Bible. The easiest thing to do, everybody has been taught about the rapture, everybody has heard about the rapture. So what we're going to do is we're going to break down the end times by the groups of people that will be present during the end times. What's going to happen? to those individual people. We're going to give you a general timeline as according to the book of Revelation, but it's prophecy. We see in part and we think that we know in all and God winks at our ignorance. Right? The apostle John, when he was called up into the third heaven to see and receive the revelation that he was supposed to write down, he saw a whole lot more than he could put pen to paper. The Apostle Paul mentioned, not even talking about the revelation. He said he was called up in the heaven, whether it's in the body or in the spirit, he didn't know. And he's afraid to talk about it for so long because of the fear of God that he had from what he had seen. And he still couldn't reveal all the things that he saw. What did he see? Whatever he needed so that he'd have fuel in the tank to fight a good fight and to finish his course. Why didn't we get to see it? Because you didn't need it. But the Apostle Paul did. Maybe it was one of those instances where he finally realized that God's strength is made perfect in weakness. I don't know. But the Apostle John gave us his best description with human words for what he saw in a godly realm, but it doesn't even scratch the surface. And just because it's the way that God revealed it unto him, doesn't necessarily mean that that's the way everything's going to transpire from 
man's point of view. Right? We're dealing with things that it's dangerous to say what God will and will not do. And it's dangerous to say, thus saith the Lord, when the Lord hath not said. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the groups of people. We're going to start with the church. Well, what is the church? The church, biblically, is the universal, everybody that has ever been saved under the blood of Jesus Christ, Old and New Testament. Because if you read your Bible, Christ led captivity captive. All those Old Testament saints that were in Abraham's bosom, they got in the same way that you and I did. Jesus had to go down there and preach to them, and they had to receive the blood of Christ. The church are those that were bought by the blood. The blood was applied to their life, and that is how they became saved. In the end times, that will not be how man comes to salvation under God. Because in every dispensation, God has a different way for man to find favor in the eyes of God. But the church, we know, will be raptured out. They're the bride of Christ. At one point in the book of Revelation, we'll get to it eventually, there is a marriage supper of the Lamb. That's where the bride, the one that he had purchased, because under Old Testament economy, there was a payment that was made between the fathers of the bride and the groom. The father of the groom would pay a dowry. Right? The purchase price would be paid, but then the son had to go prepare a place. The son had to go and meet not only his father's, but the bride's father's expectations. That everything was going to be prepared, that everything was going to be provided for, that she would want for nothing. Well, did he not say that if I go to prepare a place for you, what's he doing? He's getting everything ready for you. He already bought you with his blood, but he has not received you yet. Why? Because he's still preparing a place. What's it going to be like, perfect? What's it going to be like, altogether lovely, because he does all things well? If he is altogether lovely, then the workmanship of his hands will also be altogether lovely. We can get a picture of what New Jerusalem is going to look like. We'll get to that eventually in the book of Revelation. But words can't do it justice. And in truth, the city is beautiful and as majestic as it may be. It's nothing compared to the light of that city. He's the Lord of Lord and King of Kings. But see, when the church is raptured out, there are some things that must take place. When are they going to happen, Brother Jordan? I don't know. I just know they've got to take place. And I know that certain things have to happen before other things, like you can't have the marriage supper of the Lamb before the rapture. We've got to be there in order to sit down at the marriage supper. Right? Some things make sense, but today we're going to deal with something that a lot of people don't like to talk about here in chapter number 5. Go down to verse number 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now many so-called Bible scholars throughout history have taken this verse, bastardized it, and that's where the belief in the secular world that when man dies that their good deeds and their bad deeds are going to be weighed and if their good deeds outweigh their bad deeds then they'll be led into heaven that's not in context what's going on in this chapter in this chapter it's written to safe people okay verse number five or verse, chapter number five verse number one for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved we have a building of God and a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens they're saying if this flesh were to pass away we know being saved in Christ that we've got a home in heaven there's a place that we're going to abide forevermore that can't be touched by this world and by the hands of this world it's undefilable because it was made by Christ then he goes down verse number 5 now he that wrought us for the self same thing is God who also hath given us the, unto us the earnest of the spirit he, and he wrought a work in you what was that salvation and as a promissory note the earnest of your salvation you received his capital S Holy Spirit 
This chapter is dealing with saved folks, not lost folks. Then we get down to verse number 10, for we must all appear. Every saved person will have to stand before one of the judgments. There are many judgments in the book of Revelation. The church has to pass through the judgment seat of Christ. No one enters eternity without some sort of judgment. But God sets the record straight on your life. Now the judgment seat of Christ is where the church will be judged. We are not being judged for sin. The church was judged for sin at Calvary. When you accepted his payment for your sin, God accepted his sacrifice and substituted it to you, which is what that word propitiation means. The sacrifice of Christ was attributed to your account. So that when the devil comes and accuses you, the Bible says that when the blood was applied, your sin was gone. The father says, Son, what's he talking about? And he's saying, Father, the blood was applied. It's gone. It don't matter. That's what the judgment of sin was. Now, the judgment seat of Christ is a judgment of accountability. It is a judgment of stewardship. It is a judgment of how you accepted your responsibility and fulfilled your role as a child of God. It is the day or the time, I don't know that it will be a day, because once we're with him, a day is just a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. But everyone that ever was that received the blood of Christ as the payment for their sin will have to stand before God and be judged on how Christ-like they really were. That's the standard. There is no secret on what the judgment seat of Christ what the criteria is going to be. He said, be ye holy, for I am holy. We could see that it was predestined that those that were saved would be conformed to the image of his son. What's the standard? What's the mold that we're going to be held up against? Christ. No surprises there. Why do you think that the earnest of the Holy Spirit, Christ promised that the Holy Spirit would lead and guide you into all truth? You can't even trust yourself on what you think is right and wrong. It takes an all-holy God and an all-holy Holy Spirit to lead and guide you in this robe of flesh into a life that will be pleasing and acceptable unto God. You can't lean on your own understanding. You've got to trust in the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. With all your strength, you've got to give yourself over to being used as an instrument for God. Why, Brother Jordan? What does it really impact? But we're not going to get into, I mean, verse number 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. You want to know why people have been going out soul winning since the beginning of the church? It's because they know the fear of the terror of what God's judgment is. They see what's coming for those outside of the grace of God. They persuade men that they need to be saved. Those that are in the faith, that have been given position, the Bible calls them bishops. Nowadays we call them pastors. They're the under-shepherds of God's flock. They persuade saved folk that they need to draw closer to God because they understand the terror and the fear of God's judgment when we have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. There will be no excuses before the judgment seat of Christ. You know what the criteria is on whether or not what you did was right or wrong? For a man that knoweth to do good and doeth it not. To him it is sin. We're not being judged for sin, we're being judged for those decisions we made after we got saved. If you knew it was something that God didn't approve of, you'll be judged for that. Every message that you've ever heard after you got saved, you'll be judged for how you received it, how you applied it, and how you lived it. Every opportunity that you had where the Holy Ghost pulled on your heartstrings and said, go tell that person about Jesus. Or hey, pick up the phone and call this person. They just need a little bit of encouragement. You're not just being judged on what you did with the gospel, although that will be a large part of it. You're going to be judged on 
your position within the framework of the church, the local church. Did he not say that we were fitly framed together? Christ being the head of the church, we being the body. Fitly framed means that he puts you, and we've taught on this before, he put you in a spot that only you could have filled that spot, that nobody else could have filled that spot. And that without you, it would have felt like the body was crippled because something would have been missing. What did you do once you were fitly framed together? Did you bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ? Did you edify? Did you exhort? Did you encourage others? Or were you one that was always siphoning? One that was always blowing in and blowing out? One that didn't contribute but wanted to claim the title of one of the church? The Bible, fact here, will make a whole bunch of people angry. There's only one place in recorded man's history where true collectivism, what nowadays people would call socialism or communism, right? but a collective communal living structure was actually successful. And it's in the book of Acts. It was the early church. And you know why that system was successful? Because none of the disciples were the head of the church. None of the bishops or the pastors were the head of the church. None of the deacons were the head of the church. They all met, met together. They didn't even have a building like we would think of today as a church. They didn't have a place that they could come out and all assemble at one spot. They met daily in each other's house, breaking bread, fellowshipping in the goodness of God. You know who was the head of the church in the book of Acts? God was. And that's the only reason that so many were able to come in and give all that they owned. They sold it. Everything that they... And what they do? They gave to the church and out of the church everyone's needs were met. That's the only place that you'll find a collective living situation working. Why? Because man wasn't in charge of the pocketbook. Man wasn't in charge of the positions. And man wasn't focused on himself instead he was focused on God there were no power plays there was just the power of God growing the church every day but each and every one of those people going to have to give an account just like Ananias and Sapphira they said they gave all they didn't they held back a portion that was their right but because they lied about it God killed them both on the spot that's the kind of terror that awaits those and God's disapproval before the judgment seat of Christ. You have to stand before a God that loved you with an everlasting love, that loves you with a love that is so profound you can't even wrap your head around it this side of a glorified body because you don't have the capacity to understand how much God truly is love. You don't know the sacrificial love that agape love that they like to talk about in the New Testament. Where he gave, not just to show his love to you, he gave to ensure that you could receive it. It's one thing to give, it's another thing to give and make sure it gets there. God didn't leave it up to a UPS or FedEx tracking number. No, God sent himself in the form of his son to hand deliver his gift to you. That's when you know that what you've got, you really want to ensure that the person gets it, you deliver it in person. Because you're worried about somebody else not doing it the right way. I've got to make sure it's done right. God cared that much on getting your salvation to you. So what standards are you going to hold you to once you received your salvation? The same standard. First great commandment, Christ said. We've already talked about it. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind, in Luke's account, with all thy strength. He said the second great commandment is like unto it, love thy neighbor as thyself. You're going to be judged out of every word that came out of this book that says how you were to live your life as a Christian. I don't care what you think it means to be a Christian. I don't care what 
such and such preacher thinks about what it means to be a Christian. I care about what Christ said it means to be a Christian because this is where you're going to be judged. His word forever settled in heaven. Why? Because it's a permanent record of what God expects. The judgment seat of Christ, everyone, without exception, that was saved, will have to stand before an almighty, all-holy God and give an account of the deeds done in their body after they were saved. Not before that judgment happened to Calvary. We're talking about a judgment of your accountability. A judgment of your responsibility. A judgment of how you were as a fiduciary. That means you received an investment. Well, Brother Jordan, give me chapter and verse on that. Well, there was a certain master that had three servants and he left and he gave unto each one so many talents of silver. And when he came back, the one that brought him the exact same thing that he had left with, what do you call him? Wicked. He said, you could have at least taken it down to the bank, letting them lend it out, and then I'd have had interest on it. The judgment seat of Christ is to see what kind of return God got on his investment. And there are great implications to what happens on that day. Keep in mind that part of Scripture that everybody likes to talk about where all the tears shall be wiped from their eyes, that don't happen until near the end of the book of Revelation. You're going to be standing before an all-holy God weeping as you realize how much you really didn't meet up to the standards of Christ. The Apostle Paul said, I fought a good fight. He finished his course. But at the same time, he also wrote, O wretched man that I am, that he was the chiefest of sinners, that even he had days where he knew what was right and he wouldn't do it. And the things that he knew he was wrong, he would do those things. None of us will meet the expectation of Christ. But there are going to be those that hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You know when you're going to hear that? The judgment seat of Christ. Where your deeds are weighed and you're going to find out how good of a servant you really were. Servants don't get to judge servants. The masters judge the servants. I'll remind you that the scripture does say that those that are first shall be last and those that are last shall be first. At the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to find that there's a whole lot of preachers that had a whole bunch of letters after their name saying how much they knew. And they're going to take a back seat to a bunch of 1200s, 1100s, 400 A.D. women that sacrificed all their day to pray and to worship God in secret so that he might do something openly. That there's a whole bunch of gray-headed grandmas that didn't have much that they could do physically, but yet they prayed over tracts that went into the mail. They would lift others up in edification and supplication. That there were those who maybe on the outside the world would have said they can't do much, but they knew how to get a hold of the horns of the altar and they knew how to touch the heart of God and they knew how to fellowship with God just to beg Him that He would meet with His people one more time. The judgment seat of Christ is where all the facade of the flesh is going to fade away. And God's going to reward you. He's going to say, here's what you invested into the kingdom of heaven. And it's going to pass through the fire of His judgment. And only those things which are gold, silver, and precious gems are going to remain. Now I said there's implications for what happens at that judgment. Give you a little bit of a preview into the book of Revelations. After the Great Tribulation, there's this thing called the Millennium Reign. That's after the Battle of Armageddon. Christ comes. He rescues the 144,000 of the people of Israel. He sets up his rule and reign he finally as it was prophesied sits on the throne of his ancestor David and he rules and reigns for a thousand years 
The Bible says that Satan will be chained for that thousand years. Well, I have time to get into all that. But over that thousand years, those 144,000 that were rescued by Christ, they're going to have kids and grandkids. And their grandkids are going to have grandkids. Over a thousand years, their descendants will continue to multiply and grow. That will be the kingdom of Christ. But there will be governorships, presidencies, to use Old Testament terms. There will be districts that are divvied up. For lack of a better term, there's going to be a Pontius Pilate, a representative of the government over every province, over every city, over every town. And depending on how you were judged at the judgment seat of Christ, that will determine your position during the millennial reign. Some will be given much and entrusted with much and oversee much because they were very faithful. And others are going to be entrusted to look over very little. Why, Brother Jordan? Because of what they did once they had been saved. That will be the final appointment. Why do you think we come back with them on white horses? He don't need us to fight. It says that a sharp two-edged sword comes out of his... He just opens his mouth and starts talking, and they get wiped off the map. Why do we come back with it? Because he's setting us up in positions in his kingdom as a reward for how faithful we were in this body. Now, I don't know about you. I don't want to be a janitor during the millennial reign. I don't want to be the guy that stands on the wall watching for enemies that aren't going to come. It's going to be a thousand years of peace. I don't want to be the guy that has to go and report to somebody else other than Christ. You say, that's selfish, Brother Jordan. I don't think so. I think that God put into every believer a true desire in that new creature to be found in favor when the Father looks and judges you. It's natural for any child want to find the approval of their father. Well, where are we going to find that approval? Well, right now you find it in fellowship. You find it being positioned to receive blessings and mercy. Because if you're not in the will of God, He's not going to pour out mercies and to be thrown to the wind, right? to be scattered, to be taken by the world. No, that's a sign. That is your proof that you are where spiritually God wants you to be. But the true place you're going to find approval is that judgment seat. Where you stand before him and say, Father, here's all that I did and labored for you. And I think a whole lot less than truly we would ever imagine are going to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. How do you say that, Brother Jordan? Because I've heard my entire life that the closer we get, there's fewer and fewer that are in and we keep hearing about a whole lot that used to be in and in truth only God knows how many people come and sit on a Sunday morning in a church that preaches the right word in the right spirit for the right purpose that believes that they're saved and aren't I don't know all I know is that there's going to be a whole lot less in here. Well done. Than have to face the judgment of God. We all have to face it. But there's some of us who will receive the judgment of God. Wonder how many of us can truly say. We fought a good fight. Didn't say we fought good fights. Apostle Paul said, I fought a good fight. He had one fight, one struggle, 
one strife from the day that he got saved. And what was that? He was wrestling against his own flesh. And he said, I fought a good fight. There was only one fight. And in order to fight a good fight, that means you didn't take any days off. Because the Apostle Paul was saved for a while. I mean, he only traveled across all of the known world at that time. Preaching and planting churches. Being a missionary to the Gentile. But throughout all of it, he says, good days, bad days, I fought a good fight. Then he says, I finished my course. You know what that means? He got from A to B. What was A? Where God saved him. And what was B? What God wanted him to be by the time he took him home. Was he perfect? No, we've already covered that. That's talking about maturity. We like to think about, well, yeah, I woke up every day and I gave it my all. That's not all of it. The faithful servant is not only active, okay, a faithful servant develops themselves. Martha was very busy around the house when she came and chided Mary and said, Lord, tell her to help me out. And then he said, Mary has found what's important here, Martha. It ain't about busying yourself, and it's not about serving people who don't want to be served. It's about sitting at the master's feet and receiving instruction. He said, what kind of difference did that make in their two lives? Well, go see when Lazarus died. Mary and Martha both came and said the same thing, but with different spirits. What happened? One of them finished their course. They received the instructions and developed. You can't finish an obstacle course if you only learn how to tackle the first obstacle. You can't finish one of those, anybody ever seen on TV, those Navy SEAL training and boot camp, you know, PT yards and everything like that, right? You can't finish one of them just knowing how to run. You got to know how to climb. You got to know how to jump. You got to know how to balance. You got to know how to grab onto a rope and swing across a pit without falling into the mud. You have to develop yourself in order to finish your course. Because in order to finish, you've got to be different than what you were when you started. Nobody finishes a race looking the exact same way that they did when they started the race. They may still look healthy. They may still be in good shape. But that race has had an impact on them. When you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, God's going to say, what kind of impact did your race have on that new creature? Were you only concerned with what was happening to you? Or did you learn that it is more blessed to give than to receive? Did you learn that you were supposed to be the salt of the earth? I know Matthew was written to the Jews. But are we not, as the church, salt for this generation? You do realize that if we're salt, and salt was meant to preserve this generation long enough that they might be able to hear about Christ, to receive Him as their Savior, that means you've got to give of yourself in order to preserve. So much of what we think Christianity is or what people have taught in modern day churches of what Christianity is, is not Christianity. It's humanism. It's about how you can make yourself better. It's about how you can be a better version of you. If that were true, Christ wouldn't have to come and died on the cross in order to save you. Because eventually man would have been able to improve themselves enough to find favor in the eyes of God. That's called the belief and the doctrine of Antichrist. That you don't need Christ. You're all that you need. And it's made its way into churches today. If those people are saved, they're going to have to give an account of that. Why at the judgment seat of Christ? For how they took and misconstrued and twisted the very teachings of God. 
But see, true Christianity, I find that all that Christ ever did was give of himself to others. He took what the Father gave to him and he gave unto those that were in need. I find where even his flesh was crying out about how it may have been tired. Or in the Garden of Gethsemane where his very flesh is hemorrhaging, coming apart at the seams under the weight and the stress of what it is that he's doing. He just prays to the Father, Father, if you would, let this, this cup of suffering right here in the garden, let it pass from me so that I may go a little bit further that I might be scourged, that I might become broken bread and poured out wine so that I can give unto others and they may become your children. Not to mention that, go read the account of the garden. He's praying for you in the garden. He's praying for those that would receive. You find it that it's any strange thing that now he's seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us he's always been praying for you why because he gave of himself so that you could become something better than what you started out as what's true Christianity giving of yourself and Christ to others well brother Jordan I don't have anything in myself that I can give to other people I understand that I understand that the flesh has no good thing. It can, all of its righteousness is its filthy rags. But I find that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. In fact, you're going to find that in verse number 17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You didn't have anything that you could give to others. Until Christ gave you something worth sharing. The judgment seat of Christ is going to be what God put in you and how you let it bear fruit. Did He not command us to go forth and be fruitful? To bear much fruit? Why? Because He put something in you that would grow and mature and manifest, that it would finish its course. You know what the course of a tree is? It goes in the ground as a seed. It comes up as a sapling. Then eventually it gets to where it starts bearing fruit. And then there are cycles of growth, then decay. Growth, decay, growth, decay. What is that? That tree's improving. If all that tree ever did was grow fruit, it would never get any bigger. It's got to go into hibernation. It's got to use that sap to what? Grow bigger as a tree. If it was only ever in the pollination stage, it would never get to the point where it bore fruit. It's got to go through those cycles of evaluation and improvement and growth until what? It can bear much fruit. You're going to be judged not off of what you were in the flesh. Again, that was judged at Calvary. That new creature is going to be judged. That new creature is going to be put on the scale and say how much of what you did was valuable, how much of it was wood, hay, and stubble, and how much of it is going to survive the fire of God's judgment. Because again, verse number 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. If you really let the Holy Ghost give you a little taste of how fearful and dangerous it is to fall into the hands of a living God to suffer his judgment to know the terror of staring, standing before the almighty the creator the I am the alpha and the omega and you've got to look into those eyes that are as flames of fire and you have to tell God why you did to his face all the things you did in your fleshly body after you got saved that's a terrible thing full of terror. But it's something that we all must do. Knowing the terror of God, we persuade men, what? To let the new creature grow, to develop, to become what it is that Christ desired it to be, which is what? A reflection of himself. 
Why? So that the Father can stand and at your judgment say, well done, now good and faithful servant. Because you don't get to the marriage supper of the Lamb until after the judgment seat of Christ. You don't get the benefits of glory without first being accountable for what you did here on earth. We don't get to that portion of Scripture where it says that at one point all of us are going to sit in His throne with Him. You don't get that without judgment. I don't know when it happens between the rapture and in the timeline of the end times, but every single one of us, shortly after the rapture, is going to have to stand before him. Because when we come back, we're on white horses, arrayed in white apparel. What's that? We've already been judged and we've been entrusted with our new bodies, with our new garments. It's got to happen before then. Well, how long is it going to take, Brother Jordan? I've already said a day is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day with the Lord. But in Earth's timeline, I think it's going to take right around seven years. Because that's the time between the rapture and when we come back. Can't prove that. That's the theology according to Brother Jordan. But I've already told you, the tears aren't wiped away from your eyes. You'll wish, regardless of how much you did on this side, you'll wish you did more. You'll be rewarded. But see, then we get to take those rewards and lay them down at His feet. You want to know why we'll wish that we did more? Because once we see Him, we'll wish and we'll understand how great and how mighty and powerful he really is and will wish that we had more to offer to him. It's not because we want anything for ourselves. It's because we see how great and deserving and worthy he is of all glory and honor and praise. Why do you think we're going to keep saying it throughout the book of Revelation so many times? Because once you see him, that's all you can say. Moses didn't even get a good look at him. He just saw him hidden in a bush that was on fire and his face still glowed. Right? Peter just got a glimpse on the Mount of Transfiguration. He wanted to stop right there and start building a temple to commemorate the day that he saw just a little bit of the Lord's glory. They got to see behind the veil for just a second. Paul got a picture of it and guess what? He was afraid to even talk about it in the flesh because of what he saw. Gave him such a fear of the Lord. John saw it and said, Lord, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. It's, it's going to be great. He says, I know you're not coming right now because you just gave me seven letters to write to seven churches and then everything else about the revelation that you gave me. But when I'm done with that, come quickly, Lord. It's going to be worth it. But so few are thinking about streets of gold. Long before you get there, you've got to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Not to mention that we're going to be the jury at the great white throne of judgment. We'll get to that eventually. And through all of it, tears will be flowing from our eyes and we'll be weeping. Some the blood of others will be required at our hands. What's that got to do with? That doesn't have to do with tomorrow. That has to do with today. What we do when we open our eyes and when we put our feet on the floor first thing in the morning. It's no joke when your pastor says that when we come in here, what's done in here has everlasting consequences. He's not kidding. What you do every day will have an impact on all of eternity one way or another. And it's because we know the terror of the Lord that we go out and we try to persuade others to be a better Christian, to be a child of God. We plead and beg with others because we have the conviction we have been convinced that it's real and that one day it's going to happen. 
Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.